Good afternoon, friends. I am so happy to be back with everyone again. This will be number 11 in the series of great interviews I've had the opportunity to conduct with members of our congregation, some who are very familiar to everyone, some who are quite new, etc. I am happy that Judith Lipnick has agreed to meet with me uh, today and to share with me a little bit of her life story, which I know is very interesting. You'll all be incredibly impressed, not only with the person and her qualities, but certainly also with her resume and all the great things she has done. Um, you'll discover we have a very talented person in our congregation. How are you, Judith? I'm fine, thank you. It's good to be back in Chicago where everybody wears masks. Yes, of course, we Floridians are under some crazy rules that are not generating much uh, tranquility or serenity, but we stay home and we try our bit. How's Stanley doing? Stanley is fine. We're we're really doing very well. One um, just back with our old stuff instead of our new stuff. Well, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to see all the interviews we've done, but I did one with the Adelmans and. They introduced you. Yes. They spoke about the fact you met in Washington, etc. And then because, I don't know if it was Neil or Stanley who got the first job in Chicago, basically the two couples ended in Chicago. Well, for, right. Well, no, Neil came back to Chicago. We went to Denver for right. a few years, for about a year and a half or two, and then came to Chicago and Stanley and Neil ran into each other on the street. Isn't that incredible? How and sad. that began just, an, a, it started up again, really, a, a, a lovely, lovely friendship. Um, you just don't get many of these, so you really have to value what you have. Absolutely. But I know that you're not a native from Chicago. You are a native from Washington, D.C., a, a real Washingtonian. Second uh, generation. A little bit about your history uh, before you okay. met Stanley. And what was Washington like growing up? Washington was a very small southern city. And native Washingtonians, my father and mother were both born in Washington, D.C. Uh, native Washingtonians, particularly maybe the Jewish community, were very close-knit. Um, mostly professionals uh, or, or in business. Uh, but very close-knit. So it's rare that somebody will ask me, about somebody who was Jewish, who was raised in Washington at the time that I was, that I wouldn't at least recognize the name and maybe have known them, you know, maybe even went out with them, I don't know. Uh, so it, 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 it was a, a marvelous place to grow up. There were opportunities there um, available to people who wanted to go and do them that probably were available nowhere else in the world. So um, I, I, I you know, little stories like in high school, getting on the bus and going downtown and going to the McCarthy hearings. Why? Because they were loud and fun and a couple of kids would get together and do that. Can't do that anymore. No. Um, so, but my mother and father were both raised there, but their fat parents came from uh, Europe in one way or another. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, I can just tell you. And did you know them? Did you, did you grow up with the influence of your grandparents? I knew my father's parents quite well and my mother's mother. My, father, my mother's father died when she was you know, 17, 18 years old. Right. So, so but, what did your uh, mother do? My, father, my father's family came from St. Petersburg, from that area, essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, my grandfather came here when he was about... I don't know, about 18, landed in Baltimore, uh, had uh, um, apparently quite a lot of success. He owned grocery stores in Washington and actually had the very first liquor license in Washington, D.C., which I have somewhere on the wall. But we, he, and my, that I know a lot of Jews did uh, in, in Washington. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, I lived in the area for two years, right after rabbinical school. I lived in Rockville. Okay. And so I learned a lot about the history there. 
And a lot of Jews went into that business, the liquor business, for some reason. Um, so it's interesting that your grandfather was sort of a pioneer in that way. Well, he had really a, a little chain of grocery stores, uh, oh. the main one being in Georgetown. And that's actually where my father was actually born, uh, in that house in Georgetown. So, um, but my father's family pretty much came uh, from St. Petersburg. Uh, my mother's family, my mother's family was full of stories. So it's sort of hard to tell what's true and what isn't. Obviously they started out in Eastern Europe somewhere, but my grandmother on that side family came through Ireland somewhere along the way. She always said she was born in Ireland. Nobody really believed her, but nobody was willing to, talk, to say much about it. And so, she, and she looked Irish. She was red haired, green eyed. She was a very pretty woman, very strong. Mm. My mother's father came through Manchester. And I don't really know how they met, but they came to this country and to Washington and opened a business, I think it was used furniture. And uh, he died, he had some sort of, uh, I don't know, whatever it was, it ended up in gangrene and he did die. Oh. And so my grandmother raised seven children by herself running that business. And so that was my, my mother. Your mom being one of the seven? She was the fifth, yeah. So did you grow up with a lot of cousins? Yes, I did on my mother's side. Right. Uh, the, the only problem was I wasn't all that close to them because my mother's family was not was ultra orthodox. They had founded the Orthodox synagogue uh, in Washington, whereas my grandfather on the other side was one of the founders of a congregation called Adas Israel, which you may be familiar with in Washington. Adas Israel is what we consider to be the cathedral congregation uh, of the conservative movement in Washington. Oh, well, it definitely is. <laughs> yeah. So that's where you grew up and became bat mitzvah, etc. Uh, confirmed. Uh huh. There were no bat mitzvahs. Do girls bat mitzvah? So, uh, but I went through Hebrew school. Right. And um, and I grew up in a very traditional family. Uh, the, the problem was that. Um, my grand, my father's family was conservative, and might as well have been Catholic. So, oh. yeah, <laughs> so for... you know, it's kind of funny. But I grew up. I mean, I could at any time I needed to have a kosher home. I have uh, up in the cabinets. Well, I think they're up behind me now. Way up on top, there's a whole set of kosher dishes and Pyrex things I've never used other than for kosher food, and uh, so I can do it if I have to. But um, uh, you know, that was my family, but I had a very traditional Jewish upbringing. Right. Very. Like so, Judy Edelman, I wasn't allowed to date a boy that wasn't Jewish. <laughs> Tell me about yourself, high school, and of course, what happened thereafter? Well, I went to public school, and um, I'd had an accident and had a really bad break on my leg. So they wanted me out of high school pretty early. And I couldn't go on to college because it was going to be in September. So my dad had a patient who said, well, why don't we just send her up to Penn State for a semester? Let her have a good time. I was supposed to go to Cornell. So I went to Penn State. I was studying um, chemi chemistry and chemical engineering. And because Cornell would not accept any of the work I had done, I stayed at Penn State. And I also had a boyfriend. Where? <laughs> I stayed there and... and have uh, Three and a half years, I graduated. Mm -hmm. But it was while I was at Penn State that I started working for the Army Materiel Command oh. at a place called uh, Harry Diamond Laboratories. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it was interesting. I think I got the job because my dad had a patient who did it for me. Uh, I was the first female technical trainee that the Defense Department ever hired, as I was told. And the day I showed up for work, the man who hired me had no idea he was getting a girl. It was really kind of interesting. 
Mm -hmm. I was very lucky. The other kid that was in the group was from MIT. He was getting contact lenses. He couldn't do a thing. He couldn't see what he was doing. So I had a very nice summer and Christmas and Easter job there. And when I graduated uh, from Penn State, I was, I think, 20. I turned 20. And um, somehow my dad, I must have mentioned it somehow that I'd done some work with explosives and he went nuts, said you can't go back to work there. In those days, that's what you did. And so I worked at NIH for about about a year with a, with a man who was studying arth arthritic uh, metabolic diseases in children. Um, wasn't for me, so I got a job at the Federal Trade Commission running their textile and fur lab. And uh, they, their laws about uh, how uh, content and labeling and Correct. So it had to be tested. So I did that and then would go with a lawyer to testify when I had to go to court. And um, then I met Stanley and Stanley was clerking at the um, Court uh, of Appeals in Washington. And um, we were thinking about getting married and he said he couldn't get married until he had a job. So I went to see somebody at the Federal Trade Commission and got him a job. <laughs> uh, I mean, it really did. That's really what happened. So then we both worked there for a while. And at some point, I decided it was time for me to have a raise. And my boss told me that because Stanley was there, good luck. So I called the man I'd worked for at the Army and went back to work there. So right. that's sort of my early career. Would you yeah. say that the underlying theme of your life and your personality is if I want it, I'm going to go out and get it? Uh, well, I've been called aggressive, yeah. I, I didn't want to say that, but certainly <laughs> very important. I am. I am. I'm, uh, I had, I, I, by the way, I, have a, I had a sister, I should tell you, who was at Johns Hopkins and quite a, quite a famous pathologist. She was seven years younger than me, and um, she's recent, she died a couple of years ago, but um, she was the good girl, and I was not. Uh-huh. So, so you know, you can. It's easy to peg me. Um, so I had a great little career at the army. I loved it. I worked on all kinds of uh, missiles and time. The, the laboratory was famous for timing devices, mm -hmm. fuses, and so um, I loved it. I mean, I loved being one of two, three women actually working in the lab. Uh, it was a fabulous place. It was very educational, and. Um, and I got to travel a lot because they would haul me out and say, guess what? We've got a girl. <laughs> so, so I was there until um, I had to retire because I followed my husband to Denver. Wow. So, so at what point did you start raising a family? I was pregnant when I was still working at the laboratory. And I had intended to go back to work there. Mm -hmm. uh, so Stuart was born in August of 68. Um, I had a project that they were in a hurry to get done. So they actually sent, they actually sent a nurse out to babysit for Stuart while I went to work. Wow. Uh, things were very different then. And um, then Stanley accepted this job in Denver and they just said, look, your slot is here. If you're leaving, goodbye. <laughs> So we moved to Denver, and we lived there for about a year and a half. He had joined a law firm out there. How many children do you have? Two. So uh, Stuart uh, was born in 68. He lives in the Chicago suburb in Glencoe, and he's married to another doctor. And uh, so they're both doctors, and uh, they have two children, mm -hmm. a boy and a girl. And my other child is uh, Laura Gale. And we all had double names when we were growing up, so she stuck with one too. And uh, she is married to a gentleman who was born and raised in Los Angeles, and he was until recently with Lionsgate. You know, I think we talked about that. And she has four children. She has twins who are back in Illinois in college. Well, I don't know where they are this year. And uh, twin boys, another boy, and a girl. Right. So she has been fruitful and multiplied. Well, God bless you. What's the bigger yeah. pleasure in life than grandchildren, right? You know, it, it's just amazing. Um, 
uh, my daughter-in-law's mother says the only reason she had her children was to get grandchildren. <laughs> she, so yeah, they are the joy. Would have skipped this step if she could. <laughs> I've heard that one before. Um, I don't know how many people realize that you are sort of a pioneer in the commuting between Chicago and New York and traveling around the country um, in the early days of cable television. Am I right? Right. I Well, what happened was I raised my children for a while. I had this little business. I had a wallpapering business on the North Shore of Chicago, which was extremely, uh, I can't think of the word I want, lucrative. And, but uh, somewhere along the line, I went back to uh, business school. I went to school. Um, you know, I'd, I'd been to, George, the army put me through Georgetown. Uh, uh. But then, you know, I, I figured I had to make a living somehow again. So I went to Northwestern to Kellogg, got a business degree, and ended up with this job at HBO through just weird things happening and being in the right place at the right time. And I started there as an account executive mm -hmm. at the very bottom of whatever it was. And my territory was Illinois, downstate Illinois. Not, I wasn't good enough for Chicago, it was downstate. So your job was to sell to, to sell affiliates? Yeah, distribution of HBO and Cinemax and eventually the Comedy Channel uh, to cable systems. So I would visit people who own cable systems and explain to them how they could make so much more money if they launched HBO and Cinemax. HBO was easy, Cinemax wasn't necessarily, uh, but um, those were the days. Those were the days when HBO was the tail that was wagging all of time, Inc. Right, right. Now, how hard a sale was that? You say for Cinemax it was, but... Well, for HBO, you have to remember back in those days, this was like in the early 80s, cable systems didn't have all of these channels that they have now. They maybe had um, 20, 22, something like that. Uh, they didn't have the equipment they have now. Uh, so you'd go and see somebody. They needed HBO. They needed HBO. That was a given. Right. Um, and we gave them lots of money and support to launch Cinemax. Right. You know, go in and say, we'll give you the satellite dish. We'll pay for the equipment. And there was all, there, I had never seen so much money wandering around. I, I didn't know. I, I, it was the most amazing thing. My boss once called me in and told me I wasn't entertaining enough. I wasn't spending enough money. Mm -hmm. I, you know, if I didn't spend it, he wouldn't get it again. Right. But the whole entertainment business was just the most amazing thing to me. What, were you doing content yet or only distribution? Oh, content. Definitely content. Um, I mean, the, the big thing that had happened when I came to work for HBO was the thriller from Manila, mm. which was a prize fight. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, they were making content. They'd started making their own movies, but they were mostly buying content from studios. Because anybody who knows a little bit about this knows that HBO basically pioneered a, a revolution in this industry if yes. with the fact that they were not subject to the same standards of um <laughs> how you call 30 it movies. No, I, yeah the, given the pgs the well they my father used to tell his patients that his daughter was out there selling dirty movies to unsuspecting people <laughs> so uh yeah r-rated movies it, i mean you know uh I mean, I'd, I'd go into cable systems and people who were working there, who I'd be talking to would say, oh, you know, uh, I don't let my children watch it because it's, you know, you know, I don't care if they watch it, you just sell it. But uh, so I would go to, my, my thing was that I would go into cable systems. I would talk to the people running the cable systems about doing marketing campaigns, um, direct mail, telemarketing, um, what, whatever we could do to get their people to sell HBO to people on the phone. We got to remind people this is all pre-internet. Oh, yeah. 
So it was a very different world. Now, once the internet world started, HBO, basically, everybody wrote its coattails, HBO and CNN, right? Well, the, 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 the worry was, well, first of all, there was a, a, a worry. Um, there was always, this was a crisis business. There was always a worry. Uh, Showtime would get some theatrical things and it would be awful and would we live through it? Uh, but the biggest problem came when uh, uh, CDs came out and people were buying CDs and not subscribing. HBO, Showtime, all these businesses are subscription businesses. Every single month, somebody looks at a bill and says, do I want to keep this? So, I mean, it's, I don't think people realize that every year, in order for me to grow the business and get my bonus, I had to not only replace half of the subscribers I had, but get new. Right. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was, could be a very hard business. So first it was the CDs, and then it was the internet. And when the internet first came, people didn't imagine the streaming. That came later. And, but cable systems started using HBO to sell internet they, because that's a great business. That stays in the home. Right. Um, and then, of course, the streaming. When I retired, it was just getting started, really, the streaming. The other thing that happened was the cable systems consolidated. Mm -hmm. So the business that I had probably is still there. I had, I had a national business that was all of the small operators. So I had the 20% of the operators and 20% of the business and 80% of the operators. Uh, but the company was an absolute joy to work for. Uh, they promoted women. Uh, there were a lot of women and very good spots. Um, we weren't selling life insurance. We, you know, we, we were selling fun. Correct. And I had a lot of fun and I met a lot of really interesting people, a lot of celebrities. I traveled with them to cable systems. Um, my biggest joy though, was that because I had the smaller cable systems, I hired the people coming into the company to mm -hmm. be account people. So my joy was promoting people, getting them promoted, you know. Uh, many of them left to get their, got their experience at HBO and went to other companies. I mean, when you work for the gold standard, that's what happens. Correct. Uh, but um, that was my, my joy, was seeing these kids. Right. You know, with their, you know, do okay. well. When Discovery stole all the young talent. It, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, of course, the talent that, that I found were people that could sell. Uh, uh, I met a lot of talent, a lot of the people, and you know, I mean, just funny things. I would have the opportunity to take people to the concerts, to the big concerts you see on HBO. They're horrible. You stand there, people are standing up, people are shouting, you can't see a thing. What you see on HBO is fabulous. Of course. Uh, look how far we've come. Just a couple of weeks ago, Disney Plus uh, basically used the same formula with a Broadway show, right? With Hamilton. It was fabulous. You would never see what you see on the broadcast if no. you saw the best seat in the house on Broadway. The, you know, the other thing that's like that is the HD operas that the Metropolitan does. Correct. Yes. So, Where is so, the industry going? So, you know, we came, we, I, I, we were still coming to Florida while I was working. But by the time we came to Naples, I had retired. Right. So, uh, and it was a good time to retire. There was a lot of consolidation in the uh, industry. The HBO was really letting people go. Um, when I retired, they let four other reg regional vice presidents go just because of that. I was lucky because I was 67. I could retire and, you know, I, and, uh, but they kept me on. I retired and then they kept me on for about another year and a half. Mm -hmm. Because of all these little people who would immediately say, well, Judy told me I could, you know, and I, I must have been the cheapest, strictest thing they ever had working for them. So, uh. so um, but, you know, my kids enjoyed it. They got to meet a lot of celebrities that they never would have met. Um, I traveled to 
places that I, I never would have gone to, small towns all over the country, Hawaii, Puerto Rico. Uh, it was just, um, even places in Canada and occasionally. It right. was just the opportunity of a lifetime. Oh. And there's just hundreds and hundreds of little stories. You've retired, you have a, a part-time home in Naples. Right. How are you busy, you're such an energetic person. Well, uh, actually we had a home up in Englewood, Florida for, for quite a while uh, and tried to retire there, but there just wasn't enough to keep us going. So we came to Naples, we bought the place at the Stratford in Pelican Bay and we arrived I guess the day of their Christmas party and this woman there got a hold of me and said, I have something for you. And the next thing I knew I was, um, chairing the, what is it? Uh, Southwest Florida high school model UN, uh, conference, which was at, uh, FGCU and run by the Naples council on world affairs. So that council became my home. I, I'm still very active. I was, I did that. I was president. Now I'm just doing their membership, but um, that was that was the key to us finding a place. Um, we uh, still belong to the synagogue up here, right. so you know it was a little hard for us to realize that we wanted to be attached somewhere in the winter, not in the summer. Right. And um, but uh, we went up to Abad a little bit because they were kind enough to do a naming ceremony for me when we first moved there. And, uh, I mean, you know, our whole family was together. We wanted to name, was it, oh, Stuart's daughter. Mm -hmm. It was over Christmas weekend, no less. And uh, so the rabbi said, come on over. You know, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was through the Edelmans that we came to Beth Tikva and found a family there. Well, I found a lot of people there that I knew already through the, the World Affairs Council. Correct. Um, but, um, you know, I like that. I was active in a giving circle in Naples, a women's giving circle. Are you familiar with those? Uh, it's a group of women who all put in a, some, a, a, a donation and then that group of women decides how to distribute it. Yes. And that, that was very interesting for me. Um, just after a while, they were going a direction I wasn't too interested in doing. So, you know, they can find they found another treasurer. That was easy. Yeah. And uh, I always so that's I always ask my friends and guests how they're coping with the current coronavirus reality. How are you guys doing? I think I think we have done very well because. Um, uh, for one thing, we were lucky. The building that we were in was pretty well locked down, but it's a very friendly, cohesive building. So, you know, between the swimming pool and the other grounds, we could get out, we could sort of see each other. Um, and, you know, uh, people were not allowed into the building. Um, and then, well, you know, I had that surgery in the rehab period, so. I was gonna um, started this whole process really from the bottom up because you had surgery the very week. <laughs> yeah. And I can relate. Okay. Yesterday was the anniversary of my surgery, which was exactly the same surgery you had, a resection. Oh my God. So I know exactly what you went through. How did Stanley make through with all that? Well, the little old ladies in the building took, took them under their care. Good. Stop the minute my toe crossed the threshold. But <laughs> nevertheless, I have to tell you, though, for people that felt as I did that the medical care in Naples was below standard, let's say. And I think a lot of it occurred because there was nobody else in the hospital, you know, because of COVID. Mm -hmm. I did get fabulous care and I've kind of changed my mind about. I'm happy to hear that because I visit a and now, but I visit a lot of people in the hospitals in our whole area, and I am very impressed with what I see, particularly at NCH. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the, you know, I, assuming all the doctors are well trained and know what they're doing, the care is, was unbelievable. I mean, we're, well, I think because there were very few patients, I can tell you that that nurse came in every day to check and see if I knew where the button was, you know, to push, to call her. 
but I got great care there. I got great care. I was over at Glenview at rehab. Right. Um, I, I was really amazed One. because I volunteer at Northwestern Memorial Hospital here. And believe me, people talk to volunteers that they don't, they tell volunteers things they don't tell anybody else. Correct. And, and the, the difference in what I perceive as the human contact care was phenomenal. Well, that's a great endorsement. Uh, tomorrow I'm attending a, in a, a Zoom seminar with the director of uh, pastoral care for NCH. Uh, she's giving a lecture on uh, care exhaustion. People who are caregivers uh -huh. are getting completely, you know, to the bottom of their energy and motivation. I'll make sure to mention to her that you gave her an endorsement. Oh, absolutely. I, I can't, I can't begin to tell you how, how pleased I was because remember Stanley couldn't come into the hospital. I had nobody. Um, and you know, ugh, anyhow, so it, 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 it was very special. Naples has been a very special place for us because um, even with the COVID, we have found that, that we have friends and, and we can do things. Uh, one of the things that I have found is that for both of us, we're doing things that we couldn't do before. For instance, your lunch things. I, I could never attend them. I had, I had a board meeting usually on Tuesday. Uh, now I can come. I mean, it's Zoom, I grant you, but I can come. Um, I didn't, I like to come to Saturday morning services. We, you know, I would show up, but sometimes I couldn't come. Uh, if I'd had Zoom, I would have always been there for the sermon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, um, uh, uh, it, it's given us things. I'm getting phone calls from people I haven't talked to in years. Uh, so, you know, there, there are some upsides to this. Um, uh, the, the Zooming and the Facebook and all that. I've been video conferencing for years, you know, rather than travel. So... This is not a new thing for me, and I am I, I'm adept with the technology, so I've not had any problem with it. I I we're managing. Good. I mean, I don't know whether we'll go to when I'll see my grandchildren if they won't put on masks. I don't want to see them. <laughs> but, um, because you know. we haven't seen our kids in 15, 16 months. Uh, and uh, there's no planning of traveling. There's nothing we can even think of doing until there is some certainty in the air, and that's not coming anytime soon. Well, we had our kids in Naples Christmas. The right. They're here, here. And um, it's very interesting. They're both surgeons, one's at the Veterans Hospital, one's out west in the suburbs. They're both operating. They're both, they have a very different view about this virus. Um, they took their family up to the Wisconsin Dells this weekend. Uh, it's just very, I mean, they understand us. Right. But they figure they're going to get it. Well, you know what? I think everybody figured that one out. The question is whether we're going to survive it. And we see nobody knows what the underlying, you know, complications could be. We don't want anybody to, get there, to risk it. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's where we are. And, uh, but, you know, at least here, I know I can go to a grocery store and that they're counting people in the store and everybody must wear a mask. The right. plane ride back was pretty structured. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you had to be wearing a mask. They didn't, this is Southwest, they didn't fill any center seats. Uh, a couple of times somebody came down the aisle and told somebody to get the mask up over their nose. Um, I mean, they were going back and forth checking, so we'll survive. I mean, if, if, if nothing else gets us, I think we'll survive this. Thank God, yes, I hope so. I always ask my guests to leave us with a good, positive thought, but I think you've done that in that you have been able to find the silver lining in all of this, uh, and, uh, and, and that's a beautiful thought. Well, we certainly hope to see you back in April soon. Well, we expect to be back and I look forward to seeing everybody. It's, it's a real joy for me to come to services and, and, and be with people and, and be able to participate in the services and uh, know 
that I can sing with everybody and it's it's done the way I think it should be done. So well, I thank you. You're the reason we're there. You're very kind and I appreciate it. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Best for the rest of the summer. Thank you. And same to you. Holiday season. I hope to see you around somehow and enjoy it. Well, you'll see me Tuesdays. No, no, but our video is streamed or the services or whatever. Uh, we're going to give out active parts. So maybe I'll send you a note telling you what I would love for you to do and tell you how to participate. I like the response of reading. <laughs> tell you that. But we'll do. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Take care. You be healthy and safe. You too. Bye-bye. Your family. Bye-bye.